got the uh, rookie camp list. We sort yeah. of went through that earlier on. The why not question of the day, by the way, hit us up in the comments, which young player you're most looking forward to seeing at the tournament this weekend. I guess the first thing sort of stood out when the Jets threw out that infographic with the young men that'll be representing the squad out in Penticton was the Colt Perfetti's on the list, and he was the feature player there. And Listen, I think in normal circumstances, he wouldn't be there, but as we talk with Billick, Listen, I think uh, it kind of makes sense, especially for such a big camp where I think a lot of is going to be uh, expected and counted on from Cole Perfetti to get him some extra reps against maybe some lesser competition that you're going to be getting in an actual pro camp and try and give him both just you know some game experience that yeah. he hasn't had in a long time to get ready for a very important training camp and a very important player in this organization. Yeah, I think in a way, Huss, this is sort of the other shoe to drop with regards to Cole Perfetti not taking part in the World Juniors. Like, I think the Jets didn't say it at the time, but this was the plan, right? That they knew, um, in addition to training camp and preseason games, and I would expect, by the way, Cole Perfetti, the Jets have six preseason games. I'll set the over-under at, uh, at at least four uh, and maybe take the over on that in terms of how many games Cole Perfetti gets in, because I think they're going to want to try and get him up to speed after missing the last half of last season uh, at such a young age. Uh, but they, they knew that they were going to include him on this uh, Young Stars roster, and I think it's a great move. I mean, I, I don't think anybody's going to be too um, tied up in in results. Like, on paper, you'd say, well, a guy like Cole Perfetti, he should be able to go and dominate the Young Stars tournament because he's his development curve is so far ahead of kind of everybody else, not only on his own Young Stars team, but the other teams that the Jets are going to face. I wouldn't be focused so much on how many goals can he score, or how many points does he get. I think it's more about just getting him into game situations. And it's a great, a great way to get a few extra reps in prior to main camp starting next week, where I expect Cole Perfetti is going to be a featured part of training camp because when you look up front and what the Jets lost in Paul Stasny, Andrew Kopp at the trade deadline, and what they didn't go out and get in this offseason, it certainly puts onus on a guy like Cole Perfetti that they are there, there will be big expectations. It would appear he's got a spot, you know, certainly waiting for him in the top six, whether that's playing with Shifley and Ehlers playing with Dubois and Connor, uh, Cole Perfetti is going to get every opportunity to, you know, thrive in, in this climate. So he is for sure, you know, okay. uh, to me, Huss, there's three players that I'm watching really closely in the Young Stars. Cole Perfetti's number one. The other two would be Chaz Lucius and Brad Lambert for slightly different reasons. But those are the three that I'm certainly watching um, closely this weekend. Well, and, and, you know, we'll talk about Lucius in a minute, but Lambert's fascinating in that, you know, and we've had plenty of time to talk about it since he was drafted by the Winnipeg Jets and by all accounts fell to the Winnipeg Jets at 30th after being, you know, a top five prospect at the beginning of the season. And, you know, he wasn't playing in junior hockey. He was playing in a senior league with men. It didn't go yeah. particularly well. And, you know, compared to the way he started the initial World Juniors at Christmas with, what, two goals, three assists in two games, um, he was a non-factor, not even part of the uh, Finnish team in the last game, I believe the last two games of the tournament in the medal round. Healthy scratch, yeah. Yeah, so um, I, I think if anything, you know, a good camp for Brad Lambert would be great for him personally and individually. And, you know, I'll ask you this. I mean, what do you think the most logical route for him this year is it? I mean, I'm sure they'd love to have him playing with the Manitoba Moose, but I think there's an argument considering the season that he had last year that it might make sense to be an impact player on a Seattle team that won a championship last year that should be a really good squad and to both get the playing time yep. opportunity up and also maybe just a full reset of confidence moving into a very new situation. Where are you at all on that? Yeah, it, it really is interesting. They have more options with Brad Lambert than really anyone else in the organization right now. And, and there's really four potential options for Lambert. Plus, he could go back to Europe, where he played last year, but he doesn't have a contract as of today with anybody. Uh, he could make the Winnipeg Jets, um, unlikely, I would say. Or, as you point out, 
Uh, he could go to the Western Hockey League where he has yet to appear, but the Seattle Thunderbirds own his rights. And as you say, looks like they're going to have a good squad. But then there's also the AHL route. Um, normally, someone of his age, having just been drafted, would not be eligible. But he's a European. Uh, and so there is that route that they could take. Um, you know, we've seen it in the past. Guys like Christian Veselainen, who start their their pro career a little earlier. So to me, Huss, I think we can probably rule out, barring something really unexpected, him making the Jets out of camp. I think we can rule out going back to Europe because it would appear that that really, that's a big reason why he fell last year is the environment over there, unless they found him another spot to play. So to me, that leaves two options, the Moose and the Thunderbirds of the Western Hockey League. It is interesting that there's been no talk, at least so far, about him being included like on the Thunderbirds training camp roster. And I get that, you know, guys who are attending pro camps, a lot of those guys started already, like the Wheat Kings, the Ice, they had guys here for a few days. They're now going to NHL camps and then they'll come back. Lambert didn't start with the Thunderbirds. Um, I'm really curious, and we may hear from him tomorrow. <clears throat> the, the Young Stars are having a skate at the Iceplex at 1.30 tomorrow, and then there's going to be an avail after before they head off to BC. So I suspect we'll talk with Brad Lambert. Maybe we'll get a little clarity as to what the plan is. But um, I do wonder if they are contemplating, you know, bringing him in under their own developmental system with the Manitoba Moose. Now, I think there's pros and cons to that. And certainly the pros are that this is a guy who's already played against older, bigger, stronger men. He was doing that over in Europe, but he struggled. So is that the environment that they want him? The AHL would be a, a tougher league than the one he just came from over in Europe. Um, I think Huss, the best thing for his confidence is probably playing against his peers and enjoying some success, something he really hasn't done in terms of just playing against guys his own age here. And that's where the Western Hockey League, to me, would make the most sense. But I guess as each day goes by and we don't hear more chatter about a potential assignment to the Western Hockey League, it does leave that that pro route open, the idea that they would start him with the Moose and they could always assess where they're at. They could reassign him to junior, maybe if they didn't like how things were going with the Moose. But I do wonder if that is almost at the top of the list right now for plans with Brad Lambert. Yeah, well, uh, you make a great point too, Mike. I mean, I think, you know, I'm really interested to hear from Brad, uh, you know, with his first time here in Winnipeg as a member of the organization, you know, with this event coming up on the weekend and hear sort of what his thoughts and goals are. I'd imagine publicly he'd say, hey, I want to come in and make the Winnipeg Jets. Right. If that's not happening, though, um, you know, where does it make more sense? And you mentioned the other guy, Chaz Lucius. I mean, Lucius is signed. He would seem to most likely be a Moose player to begin the year. But, you know, with some of these prospects, much like we've seen in the past, from an organizational standpoint, I think there is a benefit to having young players like that kind of come in, cut their teeth in the American Hockey League together at the same time. I mean, hopefully you can maybe work out some chemistry if the guys are playing together, yeah. but also to have other players sort of in similar situations as they are right now at the same point in their career sort of go through things together together. I think there's something to be said for that as well. Uh, and that is the reason why I kind of think that, to your point, I think that if he shows that he's capable of hanging around at that level. I think they prefer to have him closer to home. I think they prefer to be able to watch him and maybe start some of those relationships with potential future teammates right out of the gate at the AHL level as opposed to being on the other side of the continent in Seattle. Well, and Lucius is a guy, Huss, of course, he was playing in the U.S., uh, but he now... Um, Find his, his entry-level deal. His Western Hockey League rights are owned by Portland, which, again, is another really strong Western Hockey League program. So there are there is that option as well. But, again, Lucius, he, he wasn't in Winterhawks training camp and then now is joining the Jets. And part of that is because I suspect he's playing in the Young Stars event. But, again, they do have those those three options with him. Europe would not be a realistic option for Lucius, but they do have the, you know, the, the Western hockey league, the American hockey league, or the national hockey league, if he came and kind of blew the doors off. And, you know, us, we talked a lot this summer about the lack of, of signings by the jets of player movement. 
uh, when it comes to the forwards that there really wasn't a whole lot other than, you know, Saku Manalainen and Kevin Stenland, um, Alex Limoges. Like, they're re- they really, those are depth guys that might be kind of competing 13th, 14th, first recall, that kind of thing. You do wonder, like, where do the Jets internally view guys like Lucius and Lambert in terms of potential options? And if they have them on the moose to start the year and they like what they see, I mean, and they're trying to usher in a real youth movement, certainly up front, uh, maybe maybe the time is now for guys like that. And I think that's why, you know, I'm really interested to see what they do at the Young Stars event. Obviously, a good showing there would help their cause. Um, but I also accept guys like Lucius and Lambert will get a good look in the preseason as well against other NHL competition. And again, they don't have to make these decisions today or next week. Uh, but it is interesting that they have so many options with these two first rounders in in Lambert and Lucius. And um, it leads to some fun speculation about where things could could end up with them. T. Conopoli in chats asking, uh, was Bauer in T-Bird camp? Well, uh, that would be a no because he just finished his 20-year-old year. He's too yeah. old right now, and he will be a pro. And I- I'll tell you what, I mean, of the guys on the blue line, and I'm sure that my answer might be different after watching some of the games, but considering what we saw from Bauer in training camp last year and the aggressiveness that he showed, um, I'm very much, and I think a lot of Winnipeg Jet fans are going to have their eyes open about this young man if they haven't seen him before. So I remember at camp last year, and I, I heard Billick on just before me talking about Bauer, because I, I remember vividly, Scotty and I were actually standing together behind uh, one of the nets at the Iceplex, and they were doing like a battle drill in front of the net. And I think it was just Scotty and I that day, and we had never really seen much of Bauer. Um, this guy gave no Fs about, about asserting his authority. And he stood out in a major way. And part of that was, you know, we were coming into camp last year, like we hadn't seen Brandon Dillon yet. Kind of the same way that Dillon opened some eyes in camp. Remember when he started hitting everybody? Uh, he took runs at, you know, Veselainen and he even knocked, I think, Blake Wheeler once, or Mark Shifley, sorry, knocked on his ass in a drill. Like, that's just something you hadn't seen much. Well, what we saw from Terrell Bauer, he was he stood out from all the other defensive prospects because he had that meanness, that aggression. I have no idea if he's got the skill set to hold up under the rigors of full-time NHL work. Certainly things like foot speed, mobility, you know, those are those are issues that I know he talked last year with us about working on that he knows he has to get better at. But if you just talk about a guy who can clear the front of the net and, you know, have his teammates backs, like there were there were certain things he did last year that I remember watching thinking he's got like some Jacob Truba type elements in the way Truba used to do a lot of that. Uh, I'm not saying he's going to be Jacob Truba. As I say, I, I have no idea what his ceiling is and if he projects. I know some people have said he projects to just be an AHL defenseman. Uh, but it'll be fascinating to see, you know, what what a year of development has done for him. And I'll also say this, Haas, he was the captain of that team out there and said, like, this guy oozes uh, character, personality, leadership. Uh, he's the kind of guy, you know, if you're going to battle, you love to have a guy like that kind of with you. Um, so, yeah, he'll be another guy, certainly on the back end when we talk. And look, we know, Haas, right now the, the blue line is pretty crowded within the organizational pipeline. He's not making the Jets out of camp this year, but he certainly could be an integral part of the Moose Blue line. And he's a guy that'll be interesting to kind of watch what a year of of pro hockey can do, uh, you know, to to his game. Staying on the Blue line, uh, you know, another interesting player that I'll be uh, very um, fascinated to see how he, you know, projects over the course of this tournament, but more so when we get into camp, is Dmitry Kuzman, who's a Belarusian defenseman that the Jets took what do they take him in the third round of the 2021 draft went and played in Flint last year had 44 points in 57 games you know from talking to people in and around the organization this is a guy that you know I want to say is necessarily under the radar as a third round pick but someone that I think they do have some high hopes for down the road and I think we all know that this blue line for the Winnipeg Jets 
will probably be significantly different in a year, certainly in two years. And, you know, the likes of Kuzman, potentially Bauer, Simon Lundmark, as well as all of the guys that had been pressing for time with the Moose last year could very well be the core of a Jet Blue line sort of 24 months from now. Well, and don't forget another guy that we won't see at the Young Stars this year because he just turned 18 and he's playing over in Sweden. But the second rounder that they got in the Andrew Kopp trade, Elias Samuelson, I mean, there's a guy that they're extremely high on. And he's, you know, he was 17 when they drafted him in Montreal back in the summer. Like he's still a couple years away for sure of coming over here. But there's another young blue liner. And, you know, for all the talk, you know, we go back to 2018 and all the changes on the Jets blue line, you know, whether it was Bufflin and Truba and Myers and and Sherratt, like, you know, what the Jets had in that run to the Western Conference final and what they lost in kind of the year or so after. Like the blue line had to go under go an extreme makeover. And we're starting to see the fruits of that labor. There was a real focus on drafting development of of blue liners and it's starting to pay off right and uh you know that what once was a bit of a weakness for the jets certainly appears to now be becoming a strength uh oh, do we have a piper sighting or a piper <laughs> hearing right now a lot of interest as to the whereabouts of piper for today's visit mike yeah no she's in the backyard uh i don't know if we, there's an intruder or perhaps a uh, rabbit or something going on <laughs> but she's she's barking up a storm but uh, Making herself uh, known. Um, back to this Young Stars camp. Um, what do you make of the goalies? And, and and maybe the goaltending situation for the Winnipeg Jets outside of Connor Hellebuck and Big Save Bay, Big Save Dave, who's on a one-year deal, will look to sort of reestablish himself and get another deal, whether it's here or elsewhere. But, um, I, I mean, is Mikhail Burden even back yet? I mean, I know he's got one year left in his deal. I was right. very interested to see what his future is because, to be honest, he didn't have a great year last year with the no. Manitoba Moose. And now we're seeing Arvid Holm and uh, this Finn, uh, Oscary Salmonen, that they uh, they signed last year. Uh, just your thoughts on where the Jets are organizationally at the goaltending position. Yeah, you know, of course, for the longest time, when you got a Connor Hellebuck and he's doing his thing and, you know, winning the Vesna and uh, nominated another time and, it's not something that you really look at as, oh, they got to start addressing. Uh, but the Jets have sort of quietly been stockpiling various prospects in net, you know, kind of one per year, it would seem. Um, you know, the Eric Comrie, obviously, for a while, was seen as the heir apparent. And that, as we know, uh, that didn't play out now. He's, he's going to go do his thing out in Buffalo. Um as for Mikkel Burden, you know, certainly some really unique tools there, but I'm not sure whether it's something that will ever translate at the NHL level. To me, a guy like Arvid Holm is fascinating. Like he's got, he's got the size, right? He's six five. I know just watching him the last couple of years, like he really stands out with his for his mobility for a big man, the way he moves. Um, you know, so he's a guy I think that you know he's 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 now. Uh, a little bit older, right? He was 98 birthday, so he's going to be going to be 25 or 24 coming up in in a couple months from now. Um, we know goalies can sometimes take a lot longer to develop, but he's the guy that I expect is going to push for more and more work at the at the AHL level with the Moose this year, and certainly that you know he could be maybe the guy uh, that they are looking at to potentially be a you know, a 1A, 1B kind of situation here in a few years. But you're right, Salmonen is a guy, they were really high on what he did over um, over in Finland. And uh, whether he can come here and kind of bring that, he's another guy with size 6'4". Um, you know, there, there's some interesting uh, prospects there. And the other, the third guy that's going to be in the Young Stars roster is the guy they just took in the seventh round, a uh, good friend of of uh, Rucker McGrory, uh, as we learned at the draft in Montreal, uh, Dominic, uh, and I, I'm going to butcher the name here, uh, Divensitis. Uh, I probably uh, butchered that, of course. He'll be headed back to the Ontario Hockey League this year, uh, but he's a guy under the character. He actually reminded me a lot of Eric Comrie just in chatting with him uh, at the draft in Montreal. A lot of just the love of the game and just, you know, everything about him, just constant smile on his face. So they do have some guys in the pipeline. Do they have a future Vesna trophy winner? 
um, percolating on the farm or ripening on the vine? I don't know, but would anybody have said, you know, when Connor Hellebuck was coming up with the moose, like would people have said that he's a future Vesna winner? I don't know the answer to that. Um, you know, you never know. Goalies are voodoo, right? It's hard to sometimes figure out what you have with them. Well, you know, and while we're talking about it, um, and I brought up the name Mikhail Burden, you know, he'll be back presumably playing this year, presumably with the Manitoba Moose. And I guess if there's an injury, I mean, might get a call up. He still hasn't been in yeah. the game. But I really do wonder at this point what the Jets think of Mikhail Burden and his future long-term in with the organization. Of course, his KHL rights were traded, I believe, over the offseason. So that is always a potential landing yeah. spot for Russian players particularly. And, you know, how things work with the Moose, I mean, if they don't think that he's a long-term solution, do they maybe spend more time giving Holm and Salmon and starts in the American Hockey League potentially at the expense of Burden this year. I mean, listen, Burden's a hell of a lot of fun to watch, um, but he probably gives, uh, listen, you got to have the defibrillator around for head coaches sometimes when he's doing what he's doing. And, you know, after a pretty subpar last year, I think he's got a ton to prove to stick around as an option in the future for this organization. And, you know, as we're seeing with this this Young Stars roster, uh, there's some young guys that the Jets have used draft capital on that are maybe a little earlier on in their path that might benefit more from the playing time, the limited minutes that are available as you can only have one goalie in the net. Well, it's a great point. And, you know, the Jets don't have for, they don't have their own ECHL affiliate right now, Huss. So it does seem to be that there's a potential log jam there. And I'll be curious to see how it sorts itself out. Cause like you say, you can only play one at a time. And there's a lot of guys, it would seem um, who need to get, you know, some reps and where are they going to get those reps? Um, you know, th that remains to be seen, I guess, like anything though, you can never have enough depth, um, never have enough options. And the Jets certainly would seem to have, again, maybe quantity more than quality. It's hard to say the quality, uh, that they have in the pipeline, but they certainly have a number of bodies kind of percolating right now. And, uh, we'll see how it sorts itself out. Of course, one of the big questions is, is Connor Hellebuck here just for the next year or two? Is he going to be re-upped beyond the expiration of his deal? And, you know, if Connor Hellebuck signs a long-term extension to basically play out the rest of his career in Winnipeg, then I don't think this becomes such a concern. At that point, you're talking about guys competing for the backup job for the next, you know, number of years. But if Connor Hellebuck is suddenly gone one or two seasons from now, well, then there's an added sense of urgency to find out exactly what you have. And if you don't believe you have the the next guy within your system, you better go out and find him uh, if you want to be competitive. I'm not sure I'm ready to even think about the Winnipeg Jets without <laughs> Connor Hellebuck at this point. Maybe we'll couch that for a later date, but it is a good point. I mean, there's so much about this season uh, and, and even the first 20, 25 games, I think, Mike, that is going to be considering the ma the major moves that I think many people thought were in the offing that didn't happen this offseason. I, I really do think that the first two months of the year, depending on how things go, could absolutely sort of guide Kevin Day off down the path that will eventually be either moving some of these guys earlier for more assets or knowing that, hey, you know what? We believed in these guys. They're getting the job done. They're proving right. us right. And moving forward, almost moving on from last year as a one-off, a blip, a disappointment, if you will. Well, you wonder if somewhere in his office, Haas, if he's got like two buttons on his table, he's got like the, the, the door number one and the door number two option. And you're right. I mean, how the season begins uh, may end up determining a lot of, of, of the path that they choose. And which button he, he hits. And I guess for some, it might be the panic button uh, if the Jets don't get off to a good start. But uh, certainly a lot of questions, and it'll be interesting. Shevel day off, he's going to speak, uh, I believe, next Thursday as camp kind of officially gets underway. Uh, so I suspect we'll get a little more sense of the sleepy summer and for the Jets and kind of what it all means, you know, in his view, uh, how much added focus, pressure, whatever, does that put on the start of this season? What is the plan for not only this year, but the next few years? Uh, certainly we'll have no shortage of questions for the GM once camp gets underway.